today's evening, we'll be presenting our work through 2022 and what are our plans for 2023. This will be split across three main verticals and blocks. The first part will be litigation. The second part will be policy engagement and parliamentary processes. It also includes transparency work, which is done through 2022 and we'll do in 2023. And finally, it'll include operations and fundraising. Because quite often for public organizations, this becomes a very critical area of transparency in growing its governance, as well as making sure where it gets its money. But first, let's come to how we started. And quite often it's important to remember where you start from to know what are your foundational principles. What were your core ideas from where you first began? And for IFF, the journey starts with the Save the Internet movement, which was for net neutrality. At that point in time, a lot of people, though limited in number, wrote to the telecom regulatory authority against free basics, against licensing of online applications. When I look back at that time, it seems like such a simple world. What we were doing is we were trending hashtags on Twitter and getting the policy change that we wanted. But even at that time, a lot of the people who were involved in the Save the Internet movement and were part of IFF or continue to be a part of IFF felt there was a need for an advocacy organization in India which would represent Indians as digitization was growing. In fact, I remember when we first made our draft for a trust deed to register Internet Freedom Foundation, there was a typo there which instead of saying Internet Freedom Foundation, said Indian Freedom Foundation. And the sub-registrar in Kalash Colony actually said, is this the name of your organization? And we changed it by hand at that very point in time. But today, digitization has indeed grown, right? It pervades every part of our life. In cities such as Delhi, there are close to two active smartphone connections for every person. In fact, I think I have three because I have a car which has something called Blue Link which I don't know why it came with, right? And I think that speaks to a lot of us, but it's still not there for a lot of other parts of our country, but doesn't take away from the undeniable reality that India today is digitized more than what it was in 2016 and 17. So this broader mandate of issues needs to be carried forward by a public organization, by an organization which is built of the belief that community action makes change possible in constitutional methods. And I think there's one constitutional method which comes very immediately to me as a lawyer. And maybe you may know that based on how I'm dressed or from my past. But let me hand over the mic to Tanmay Singh, who will explain to you how we've carried forward this at IFF. Thanks very much, Apart. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming out on a weekday. Uh, many people are going to say thanks so much for coming out uh, despite the traffic. I'm going to focus on the weekday part uh, because uh, I we wanted to catch you before you all went off for your Christmas breaks, which are well deserved uh, in your case as much as it is in mine. Uh, now, I, I am Tanmay. I manage the litigation vertical at IFF. Uh, the litigation team consists of Krishnesh, Ramya, and Gayatri, and you will meet them. Uh, we are helped by our incredible off counsel, uh, Gautam Bhatia, Vrinda Bhandari, and Abhinav Sekri, who are not here, um, but if you guys see this on YouTube, thanks guys. Uh, love you. Gautam is here. He's still here. Dekh lo bhai apart. Batao, hame pata hai. Anyway, uh, now what we've done this year and what we intend to do this year uh, in the next year, uh, our, my colleagues will talk about it more in detail. Uh, if you excuse me, somebody's calling and I must cut it. Uh, what I do want to talk about is actually I will address a question that came from uh, our host for the evening, Akhil who is currently stuck in Andheria mode traffic. Uh, but he wanted to know about how and why we litigate the cases that we do. Uh, and basically, there's two ways in which we go about it. Uh, we approach uh, the marathon and sprint method. And some cases we build out over many, many months and many, many years. Uh, and there are lawyers uh, who are sitting here who will absolutely understand this, which is that most often uh, the way we practice is that our respondent number one is the government of some sort or the other. So it's either Union of India or it's the government of some state or it is a ministry or a department. Uh, what that means automatically is that the filing we're making is a writ petition. Why that's important 
is that uh, in a writ petition, you don't have a lot of time to go into details at a later stage. There is no discovery stage. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, a trial going on with admission denial and those things. So it's best to put your very, very best case, case right up front, right in the beginning with all of the filings that you can make. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, legally, you are required to exhaust your alternative remedies. So what that means is uh, we end up, uh, when we decide that there's a, there's a case that is super core to our mission, uh, we'll file RTIs, we'll follow them through their appellate stages, uh, we'll file representations and legal notices, we'll follow up on them. And then we will gather all of the various information that we can, and then we'll file a case. Uh, a great example of a long game that IFF had played uh, was the uh, 66A case uh, uh, relating to the Shreya single judgment. Now, many people thought that the Shreya single judgment was done in 2015 when the Supreme Court uh, struck down 66A as being unconstitutional and being horribly vague. Uh, and just to jog memories, 66A said that if you say something that's offensive, online, you, go, you get to go to jail for three years, and offensive could mean anything, but the section did not clarify. Uh, so in 2015, it gets struck down, uh, but we found over time that it was still being used by the police and by uh, local courts to prosecute people under a section that functionally no longer existed. Uh, two years later, uh, PUCL had filed an application and we had legally assisted PUCL. Uh, to get directions from the Supreme Court to effectively implement the Shreya single judgment that they had um, issued in 2015. Now that case took two years. In 2019, the Supreme Court said, okay, perhaps they don't know. So what we'll do is we'll send the judgment of Shreya single to all the police stations and all the local courts and we'll tell them, bhai, ye to hai nahi. To stop prosecuting now. We found that that still did not do it. Uh, so then what IFF did was over the next few years, uh, we partnered with a uh, with Civic Data Lab that's based in Madhya Pradesh. Shout out to Madhya Pradesh. Uh, we launched a project called the Zombie Tracker. What we did in partnership with them is that we selected 11 states because uh, the theme for the evening is that our resources are limited. So open your purses. Uh, we partnered with them. We selected 11 states. We went to the ECOS website for every district court in that state. Uh, 11 of them, and we found out every 66A case that was still continuing in that state. Uh, we tabulated all of that. We made an application. Uh, well, we launched a website for public um, viewing in 2021. In July, we filed another miscellaneous application. We brought that all of that data back to the Supreme Court and said, boss, this has not uh, done it. So you need to like really step in. Uh, I remember uh, Justice Nariman hadn't retired yet. It was his judgment, Shia Singhal. So he was livid. You were like, bhai, ye kaise ho raha hai? Judgment de diya. How are you guys still prosecuting? What is this? You call all the states. You get all of them to submit affidavits saying, how is this still happening? And all the states did. Uh, this was then, in October of this year, eight years later, the judgment came where the Supreme Court said, okay, uh, you've not done it yourself, so we're going to step in and we will do it. We will close with this order every single 66A case that still exists in India. Now that took, why are you clapping? That was not me. That was <laughs> this eight years, man. I've not been at IFF for eight years. So this, the IFF team has been working on it for that long. Now to contrast this, this was, if you've guessed the marathon that I was talking about, this was not the sprint. To contrast this is the sprint, which happened in March uh, of this year, where the West Bengal government said, Ki 10th class ke bachchon ko board exam dene hai. Pure state ka internet band kar do. So we were like, bhaiya, aise kaise band So we found out on Sunday night, because of course we found out on Sunday night. <laughs> and uh, Monday morning, uh, we started uh, drafting. By Monday, we were done drafting. And now the lawyers in the room, they're like, yeah, this we understand. This is, we do this every week. Why are you bragging about this? But to the non-lawyers, uh, for their sake, just let me have this. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 24 hours, we drafted the petition. Uh, we sent it over to local council. Uh, they had it filed by Tuesday morning. Uh, after lunch on Tuesday, it was mentioned. We got a listing for the next date. Uh, by Wednesday, uh, over the course of Wednesday and Thursday, uh, detailed hearings were uh, took place. And by Thursday afternoon, there was an order saying, by Friday, say internet wapas karo. And that was incredible, because that's never happened before. Uh, in Woo! India, now you can clap, because that was me. Woo! I was certainly at IFF in March. So, um, yeah, our clapping's to distract, okay? What was I saying? 
ha so that's the first time that's happened uh, the, uh, the no ongoing internet suspension has been uh, lifted in india uh, either before or since on grounds of anuradha basin or proportionality uh, now this was the sprint uh, and that's really like the way we do it uh, what i'm going to do now is i'm going to give the mic over to krishnesh who will tell you a little bit about what we've done this year before i do that i don't think i'm going to get the mic again so i do want to say if anything here was interesting or anything that's going to come after this seems important to you uh, please consider becoming a member of iff so rupees lagte hain our memberships begin at 100 bucks a month i'm not a member but you should yeah thank you so much tanmay i'm krishnesh Uh, I'm also a lawyer at IFF. I'm the associate litigation counsel. Uh, in the spirit of shout out to Madhya Pradesh, I'm also from Madhya Pradesh. Uh, <laughs> you may notice that's a theme here. <laughs> uh, now, as you can see, our docket has increased to 34 cases this year, uh, in comparison to 26 from last year. We have instituted 10 cases this year. We have expanded our practice to newer forums. We are we have now filed cases in Telangana High Court, Calcutta High Court, uh, Rajasthan High Court. and the competition commission of india uh there's an interesting thing here uh, which is the last one which is total samosa and cold coffee treats in 2022 this actually signifies the victories we got because every time there is a victory tanmay treats everyone in office with samosa and cold coffee uh so this says six but it's actually seven now uh because this morning we got an important order from the kerala high court uh we were representing indian kanun in proceedings related to right to be forgotten uh and uh, kerala high court passed an order uh where they said that the right to be forgotten needs to be balanced with the right of the public to know uh this order <laughs> went uh this order was great for the litigant we were representing uh, i understand that right to be uh, right to be forgotten is generally a thorny issue and we are also constantly developing an understanding of it uh but the kerala high court judgment does in like we hope because we haven't had the copy of the order yet it was pronounced in open court but we hope that the uh, order increases all of our understanding of how right to be forgotten needs to be developed in india apart from this i want to talk about two other samosa parties uh, which happened this year uh, one is section 124a now i'm sure all of you must be aware of 124a and the and its checkered past it criminalized any statement which excited disaffection against the government uh yeah i hope this is better yeah uh so it criminalized any uh, statement which excited disaffection against the government so in 2021 we challenged the constitutionality of this provision on behalf of an association of journalists section 124a as i said is a colonial era, era relic uh 75 years ago freedom fighters were put in prison using this provision in the past few years internet activists have also been put in prison using exactly the same provision uh this year after extensive hearings where we were led by senior advocate c u singh uh we and several other legal teams were able to persuade the supreme court to put this provision in abeyance while the union government decided to reconsider it this was an important victory because it affected ongoing trials where section 124a was used to charge people uh because they were dissenting against the government uh and uh, this is something which i'm personally extremely proud of uh, because it required a lot of work over several days where we filed several written submissions before the supreme court in order to persuade them that this provision needs to stop uh this is an ongoing battle though it's an interim order which we have received we hope to have a final order one day where supreme where supreme court finally strikes down this provision uh forever uh another important achievement uh is how we were able to ensure that mighty unblocks vlc media player uh i don't know for all of you but growing up vlc media player was personally something which i was really fond of uh i mean i all the movies which i ever saw were on vlc media player for a long time before netflix and hotstar decided to disrupt things uh but in march this year the government decided to block the official website to download vlc media player in india as a result indians did not have an official place to download it of course there are third party sources with their own viruses where you can download this website they did this without granting vlc media player a hearing or a copy of the blocking order we sent a legal notice uh, vrinda who is our off counsel appeared before mighty and tried to persuade them that vlc media player needs to be unblocked uh, surprisingly even for us they did decide to unblock vlc media player 
uh, which which was which was quite incredible actually because uh, it it's something which usually does not happen. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot talk uh, more about it because the government requires us to maintain confidentiality regarding everything thing they do regarding censorship orders. Uh, that's a separate issue which we are working on, and we hope to ensure that censorship of on the internet is more transparent in the future. Uh, lastly, apart from these six now seven samosa parties, uh, we have continued to work on cases we instituted in 2020 and 2021. IT rules is still ongoing. It's now before the Supreme Court. We were able to ensure that Supreme Court did not stay the important orders we got last year from Madras and the Kerala High Court. Uh, Pegasus uh, is, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> again, still before the Supreme Court. There's a report which has been submitted, and uh, we want to ensure that the report is in the public domain soon. So January, the litigation team will be working on it. The litigation team will have Tanmay, uh, Pramya, and Gayatri. Uh, this is my last member's call, so I'm personally quite emotional to be here. Uh, and I would like to thank all the members, everyone, all of you, to support us over the past two years. We've achieved incredible things, which I, I didn't think we would be able to, like we would in, the, in, in my time here, but we have been able to. Now, in the spirit of handing over, which has been the theme of my work in the past two weeks, <laughs> I would like to invite Ramya who has joined IFF as an Associate Litigation Counsel to talk about the Digital Patraka Defense Clinic. Uh, before I go, there's a QR code here where you can read more about IFF's strategic litigation's vertical, vertical's work in 2022. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krishnesh. Um, hello, everyone. I hope everyone's feeling comfortable and you're feeling warm and had a chance to get a drink. My name is Ramya. I am the Associate Litigation Counsel here at IFF and also the Case Intake Manager for the Digital Patrakar Defense Clinic or DPDC. And I'm here to talk to you about what we have done and achieved in this last year. So for those of you who don't know, um, what is DPDC? I think the best way to think about it is like your neighborhood friendly uh, doctor's clinic, right? You know that at this clinic, no matter when you go, or not actually no matter when you go, but there are certain hours that this clinic works that you know he'll be there on maybe Saturday evenings or Sunday mornings. It's these small specific times, but you can go there with any problem you have. You can say any ailment, any complaint, they will be there to give you a quick remedy, to help you out, to like diagnose your problem and send you out with a diagnosis, right? And that is kind of the work that we do here at DPDC, but it is for journalists. And secondly, it's on Zoom, right? So this has been our model. And so what have we done over the past year at this clinic? We have had around 60, over 60 journalists approach us with issues regarding anything from being taken down on uh, blocked on Twitter to facing threats against the reportage. and out of those 60, we have successfully provided legal assistance to 45 of them. Um, 12 of these cases, however, were big enough that required more planning and more strategic process. So that resulted in them going to court. So out of these 12 cases, what was one of them that stood out? So that would be Tanul Thakur's case. So if you don't already know, Tanul Thakur is... Um, a content creator, he's also a film critic, and he came out with a satirical website called dowrycalculator.com in 2011. But somehow, for some reason, the government decided now, in 2021, that this is offensive and this needs to be banned. So similarly, like VLC, Tanul Thakur's website was banned without giving him any notice, and neither was he given a, a hearing for him to argue and defend why his website should not be banned. Um, when we took this up, it was something like I was following behind the screen because I was not part of IFF at that time. But we were successful in getting an order in this case where Mighty or the government had to give their banning order as to why they banned Tunnel Thakur's website, which is something that has never been done before for a content creator. So that's a big win, number one. The second thing that also happened is that the government required to now give Tanul a post-decisional hearing. So now he was given an opportunity to go and explain before Mighty as to why his website shouldn't be banned. 
However, it, even though it is great and it's a great precedent, like precedent in terms of um, the law that we have content creators, websites, blocking orders now being given to the content creators, it is still a challenge now because post his post decisional hearing in 2022, the government still decided to ban his website. So that is now, which again, the order copy was not given. So this is now still an ongoing fight and we are fighting this out in the court in furtherance of our um, promise and uh, commitment to transparency. This is DPDC's work from the legal side of things. DPDC in furtherance of um, legal literacy for journalists also engages in events and also publishes uh, practical guides. So in terms of events, we have had four events. One of them took place physically in September called Impolite Conversations, which we collaborated with News Laundry 5050. And it was a grand success with over 200 people coming in and people from tech policy and journalists and media came to have a conversation about what it means to engage in this space. Um, if you're also interested to be a part of such events or engage with us on Twitter's uh, spaces as well, feel free to follow us at Patrakar Clinic on Twitter. Secondly, another thing we do is we publish practical guides. So they are blog posts with distilled, concise information about legal remedies journalists can aware, like avail. So some of the practical guides we've published have been on sedition, have been on protecting journalistic sources, and we do this in 50-50 collaboration with Bharucha and partners. So if you're also interested in like looking this up, seeing what information is available to you, feel free to also, actually do check out our website um, at patrakardefense.in. Um, so this is what we have done, and these are the, the events we can, plan to continue and keep on forward, including in 2023, we plan to host another impolite conversations, but I will keep it short because we have Gayatri, our newest legal member team at IFF, and she's been here exactly 10 days now, who will tell us what we have in store for 2023. So please welcome Gayatri. Thanks, Ramya. So here are our very exciting plans for 2023. So the transparency vertical has been absorbed by the litigation vertical now. And our approach to transparency shall remain the same as any other contested litigation matter. Based on our past learnings from this year, we shall reduce the volumes of RTIs that we file. However, we will streamline and prioritize uh, RTIs on the basis of the need for disclosure and our capacity to follow up through all stages of the appellate process. Uh, now, as Krishnesh has already told us, our litigation docket expanded significantly in 2022, and we intend to continue the same pace in 2023. Uh, a really great unintended consequence of the pandemic was that IFF was able to expand our practice to newer forums like the state high courts. And since hearings were online, uh, geography was not a barrier to attending these hearings. And for 2023, we intend to expand our practice areas outside Delhi and other metropolitan high courts. In our learnings from previous years, success in such cases is almost entirely dependent on networks with local counsel. And to sustain such networks, we really do need your support. So please donate to IFF, uh, which is why the focus for next year shall be not just reaching out to benches outside Delhi, but also exploring the bars beyond Delhi. So in terms of our core practice areas, we intend to expand on the challenges to unconstitutional violation of digital rights. And we intend to do so by uh, advocating for reforms in criminal procedure that in protect privacy during the investigation process and through competition law as well. Uh, since we particularly intend to go beyond thinking of how the government regulates your digital rights to how 
big tech regulates our digital rights. So thank you very much to everyone in the audience and their phones for listening to this conversation. Uh, I will now hand over to our amazing policy team. Thank you, Gayatri. I'm pausing for applause. <laughs> Un unlike Tanmay, unlike Tanmay, I have uh, no issues accepting applause for work that was done before my time. Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> uh, but but seriously. So uh, if you're keeping count, I'm going to be the third person tonight telling you, you know, thank you for joining us on a weekday. Thank you for braving the traffic. Uh, if you're also keeping count, I'm the first person on stage who's not a lawyer tonight. Uh, but anyway, so on that note, I'm Pratik Wagre. I'm the policy director of uh, the you know, at IFF, and the policy team will be in the next few minutes. The policy team that currently consists of Anushka Jain, Tejasi Panjia, and Gyan Tepati uh, will be talking about what 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 we've done. Right uh, now, how does one describe what the policy team does? Right. Uh, if I would you know if put it in very simple terms, uh, one aspect, but a huge aspect of it is engaging with various stakeholders. Right now, that can be government, that can be private sector. Uh, there can be various civil society organizations, the media, many of you are in the room. Uh, but most importantly, uh, it's the public, right? And I think this is something that we've always said, uh, that our goal is to always ensure that uh, the public has a say in uh, in public policy, right? Uh, now, the team will talk about some of the things that uh, that we've done. But what, what I want to focus on is some of our, some, some of our sm small wins, right? And some of you who might know me, some of you who might know me from before, know that I have a sometimes bordering on an unhealthy obsession with the information ecosystem and how communication happens. Uh, now the rest of you know it as well. Uh, so it should come as no surprise that I'm going to frame the next part on, in the context of communication, right? Uh, so over the last decade, uh, what's happened is the way that we've communicated has completely changed, right? The scale and structure of human networks have changed in ways that uh, we never really could, could, could conceive. Now this has advantages, this has, this has disadvantages, uh, but it's got a whole range of effects that uh, societies are yet to uncover, right? Uh, forget, forget even understand, and uh, that's something that uh, that we still have a long way to go. But, but as a civil society organization, I think we've benefited to this from some extent because we've been able to engage with uh, with people with hi and you know highlight issues that otherwise may not have been you know gotten the same amount of attention or may have gone by uh, unnoticed, right? Uh, I, you know, one example of this, and most of you will probably remember this, uh, is a thread that we did uh, recently on digital rights issues as Shah Rukh Khan movies, right? Uh, a lot, lot of you reached out to us, uh, and you know, looking at the response to that, uh, I basically said that look, after this, we should just do consultation responses as memes. Why are we writing documents after documents? This is this is what this is what we should be doing, right? But but on a, on a more serious note. Uh, you know, let's uh, let's take a journey now, right? Uh, to a time long, long ago, uh, there was no telecom bill, there was no DPDP 2022, there was also no DPB 2021. Anyone want to guess what time period I'm talking about? August, yes, right? August. So yeah, long ago. Uh, but specifically, uh, you know, uh, August August 19 is uh, when we had put out, uh, you know, a tweet thread on. Uh, IRCTC's plans to monetize uh, customer information, right? And this was something that you know we 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 were able to get uh, based on I think uh, a random tweet that we saw, uh, and then TGC went and uh, actually went to the website and tried to you know ISV website pulled up the tender. So thank you TGC, thank you random person whoever you are, uh, and you know we're very grateful that many of our, our colleagues in the media also picked it up, highlighted that issue, and as a result of the attention uh, that got. Uh, you know, in, in subsequently, IRCTC actually withdrew that uh, withdrew that tender, right? Uh, and they were also called to testify in front of uh, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Communication and Information Technology on citizen data security and privacy. Right? Uh, an another one that uh, another quick win that I want to talk about uh, is you know no samosas. These don't meet uh, Tanmay samosa bar, uh, but and this, this this policy is a mouthful, so I'll probably get it wrong. But Meti had uh, put out a draft for the Indian Data Accountability and Use Policy 2022, right? Uh, did I get it right? Okay. Oh, oh. Yeah. All rehearsals, I've got this wrong, uh, and and that trend continues. Uh, but so anyway, so 
India data accessibility and use policy. Did I get it right this time? Okay. Uh, so and and the website basically said that uh, you know it's it's been made with consultation with with, with stakeholders, uh, but it did not reveal who those stakeholders are. Nor did it uh, I you know specify what type of feedback uh, that th those stakeholders are, you know had given. And this was a concern uh, to us. So we raised this saying that this is not something that's in line with. Uh, the pre-legislative consult consultation policy of uh, 2014. Uh, so this was raised, you know, we, we, we did the Twitter thing, we did op-eds, uh, and what eventually happened was that uh, Meti did go on to update their website to say that, uh, you know, this will be finalized after getting uh, input from, from, from stakeholders, right? So, so yay on that, at least in the short term. Uh, but, uh, you know, on, on that note now, I want to, this is some of the, you know, the, 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 some of the smaller things, smaller wins that I'll talk about, on that note, I'll turn it over rather fittingly to uh, to Anushka Jain, who also, I think, with the exception of Apar and probably DKG, is one of the longest-serving members on the IFS staff, to talk about some of our more long-term work uh, in, in advocacy and engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Pratik. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Anushka Jain. I'm the policy counsel at IFF. My work uh, relates to surveillance, data protection, transparency. But today, I'm going to talk about something very specific. Uh, which is what do we do when there is a bill or a public consultation that has been released. Our work spans across uh, various issues and methods of engagement. However, a big part of our work relates to engaging with the government. I don't have to tell this crowd about how this engagement has gone up in the last two months with the data, uh, data protection bill and the telecom bill released back to back. However, I'm going to tell you the strategy that we adopt uh, when these legislative proposals are released. Whenever a new bill is released or a public consultation is announced, our first goal is to explain the issue to our community. Thus, we try to put out a brief explainer on the legislation within 24 hours of its release, which is something that we were successful in doing um, for both the recent bills. Our thought process behind the swift response is to ensure that the public knows what the relevant issues are, and also to some extent to shape the narrative around these issues towards what IFF thinks is the solution. Uh, for this, our next step is public writing. Uh, almost every staffer on the policy and litigation teams, as well as the executive director, of course, writes in leading newspapers, either by talking about the proposal and its shortcoming in general, or by selecting one particular issue according to their expertise and breaking that down. This year, IFF staff has written almost 40 op-eds and other articles in leading newspapers and other portals uh, on the issues which come within our mandate. Another way in which we try to in, uh, increase public awareness and understanding around these issues is through events. Uh, our members' briefing calls, which are created specifically for our community, break down each specific provision of the legislative proposal um, in question and also provides our community with space to ask specific questions that may have uh, directly to our staff. Uh, we did these calls for both the telecom and the data protection bills. Uh, in addition to this, we also attend events organized by other organizations, including panels and roundtable discussions to add to public understanding. Our next step, obviously, is to develop deeper understanding around the legislative proposal, which we then uh, send to the relevant authorities through our consultation response, but even then to ensure that these convoluted concepts are brought closer to the public. Uh, we try our best to break them down into easily understandable and even interesting uh, bits of information with the help of our comms team. Basically, we make memes. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that one of the most fun things that I've ever done at IFF uh, was the Taylor Swift songs as DPB bill issues tweet thread that we'd made this month. Next, uh, we publish briefs. Uh, publish briefs. Um, our telecom brief is up right now on our website, and our data protection brief will be up in January. Um, through these briefs, we aim to provide more contextual information, such as history of the legislative propos proposal, what other stakeholders have said, um, to enrich the understanding of our community. Lastly, and this is something that we've started doing recently, uh, we have started making public our uh, template responses uh, to allow the public to draft their own submissions in response to the public consultation in an effort to drive up engagement by the public. We hope to repeat this with all the upcoming public uh, consultations, especially with the Digital India Bill, which should be here any day now. Um, now I want to invite um, Gyan Tripathi, who is IFF's policy trainee, to take the stage. Thank you, Anushka, and hello, everyone. I'm Gyan Tripathi, and I manage the Transparency Vertical at IFF. In 2022, we filed 218 RTI requests and over 47 first appeals with, before various public authorities at the union and the state level. We also filed three second appeals before the State Information Commission, 
throughout the year, we got some very crucial responses, and you can read our report card from the QR code on the site. In a significant response, the Delhi police told us that it treats all results above 80% similarity as positive results, which means if you fare 80% on their FRT tracker, you will be treated as a suspect. We were able to get this response after two years of constantly following up on our RT applications first filed in 2020 and 2021. In another response, the Ministry of Law and Justice told us that they do not keep records of the legal opinion they provide to the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and also to the Ministry of Communication. It cannot be highlighted enough how bizarre this is. The Ministry of, in law, the Ministry of law provides legal advice to these ministries in the capacity of a legal advisor to them, and yet they claim to not keep a copy of the legal opinion they provide. We all remember Arogya Setu, India's contact tracing application. This year, in June 2022, we got to know that it is now operating without a data sharing and knowledge access protocol. In response to given to us, the ministry said that it has not been extended beyond May 10th. We know that the empowered group which was managing this was dissolved in September 2019, and yet subsequent extensions was, were given to it until May 10th, 2022. Now the situation is that Arogya Setu not only lacks a statutory basis, but also lacks a data sharing protocol. The data collected under it, the, we, do not, we don't know the status of the data collected by Arogya Setu. After one of our staffer received a call from their booth level officer asking them to share their Aadhaar details, which will then be linked to their voter ID, and various media reports also highlighted this, we filed several RTI applications with the chief electoral officers of state asking them about the nature of Aadhaar linking and voter ID. The, among the several of the RTI responses, we, we were told by all the CEOs that this is voluntary. The responses also included the letter dated June 4th from the Election Commission of India, which clarified the voluntary nature of the program. Yet the BLOs continue to insist on your Aadhaar numbers. Thank you, and now I'll hand over to my friend Tejasi. Thank you, Gyan. I am Tejasi, and I'm the Associate Policy Counsel. Um, so my colleagues at the policy team have done a great job explaining the kind of work pol the policy vertical undertakes, um, the way in which we do it, and the processes we follow. Now what I'm going to try and do is give you the bigger picture. And what better way to do that by than by giving you the stats? Now at this point, I hope you've had at least one drink, because the number game is clearly not everyone's favorite thing. Um, I'm kidding about the numbers, not the drinks. But seriously though, the numbers give you a rather clear picture. It tells you about our efforts that we put in and the outputs we achieved. So on that note, we participated in 13 consultations this year. That means 13 times this year, we put in the hard work, the effort, the thought, and the dedication that Anushka just walked you through. Um, for the next statistic, if I were a singer, I would sing Likhe Jo Khat Tujhe. But I am not, so I will spare both you and myself of the embarrassment. And I will tell you that we wrote 104 letters this past year. Uh, that is amazing. Great work, policy team. Uh, and continuing on that upwards trend, the IFF's project Panoptic, um, shout out to Anushka here, uh, is currently tracking 126 facial recognition technology systems in India. Um, if you haven't already visited their website, please do so today after the presentation. Um, now, my colleagues have already spoken about how our end goal is essentially to involve the public in public policy. And many people in this room, I know, they know how difficult this task is. It's, it's, a, it's a huge task. But we try our best. And to that end, uh, this year we published six public explainers, briefs, or summaries to essentially make um, you know, complex policy issues, uh, to simplify them and to get them across to our public. We did that for cer the certain directions, the notified IT amendment rules, the telecom bill, the draft data protection bill 2021, RIP. And uh, we're currently drafting one for the DPDPDP, BBB. Um, you guys know the drill. So, okay, so we've covered you know, how we engage with the union and the state government, and also with the public. But it's important to not stop there. And that is where our parliamentary outreach comes in. 
we basically um, this year assisted several members of parliament on four very very important matters uh, we've also held several in person briefings with mps and as well as with their policy and research teams um at this point a huge shout out to gyan who helped us expand our pa uh, parliamentary outreach vertical he did a great job um so essentially uh, we've tried our best to connect with each and every stakeholder um and get our voice across to them with that i think i've unwrapped the policy vertical but that was 2022 and 2023 is in 9 days wow um so let's talk about 2023 uh, we are very very excited for the coming year um it we're excited because it means new projects new better strategies and processes uh, an opportunity to learn from our past errors and to improve on our work um uh, keeping that in mind the policy vertical has some exciting things coming up and i'm going to give you a sneak peek So we have four exciting new projects coming up. Uh, the first one has got to do with uh, the digital divide in India. We um, this project would essentially develop on and house IFF's connectivity work. The second project, a special one for me, um, is basically has a service-oriented approach, which will help users navigate through the dense and complex policies that several social media platforms have and also guide them through the platform specific redressal mechanisms for each of these harms our next project emerged out of our concerns um, regarding the increasing digitization of policing and surveillance technologies and lastly uh, the last project will be centered around electoral integrity and the influence of data hubs on uh, election outcomes but that's about projects we have more uh, we'll move to our pa parliamentary outreach plan we hope to deploy greater resources towards engaging with not just members of parliament but also state legislators we are also hoping to get into force that's free and open source software um and assist two state governments in creation of state specific force policies these are big plans and the wheels are already in motion you'll hear more about it in 2023 now speaking of 2023 uh, i'm sure we have exciting new year eve plans Uh, but i wonder how we'll feel if the government releases the digital india bill on 31st december uh yeah that is for mighty not for me yes thank you <laughs> thanks for clarifying um but okay, either way whenever that does um get published it's an opportunity for us especially for us it's it's an opportunity to pull up our socks and not just because delhi in january is sub zero temperature but because uh we are ready to track the three key developments that we've already been tracking and are hoping to track the telecom bill the dptpb and the dib we will keep our eyes on that and anything else any other key piece of legislation um that's about to come in the coming year to ensure last mile awareness we will also adopt new strategies such as video explainers um to basically again simplify these complex policy issues now um that comes to an end but i'll just say this uh, several times people have told me that you know what i have has to say is quite bold and uh, some people have used the word word courageous and that has been a matter of pride to me and i will just promise you this in the coming year uh, i have promises to be bold to be courageous and to be unfiltered with that <laughs> i'll hand it over to my friend and colleague ashlesh bradar hello uh, i can't see you guys clearly because of the light that's flashing in my eyes but yes uh, i'm ashlesh i'm the campaign and advocacy associate at iff and uh, i'll be here talking about our literacy efforts 2022 was uh, special for me like uh, with this year i finished my first year at iff and i'm grateful to all our community and the lovely people at iff but coming back to yes tanvi coming back to more important things memes uh 2022 saw us experiment with chaotic memes throughout the year from asking the ministry of uh, electronics and information technology to reply to our sms uh to taking help from our good friend asha to bring light to internet shutdowns uh but we don't always get it right i remember this one time uh, this particular one we tweeted out that uh, we were experimenting with this new format which hadn't caught on we tweeted that uh, we would help uh, mighty to break encryption and as soon as the tweet went out uh, abar sent a text on the main group asking our twitter handle has been hacked please change the password <laughs> uh, sorry abar <laughs> but yeah we always we don't always get it right uh, moving on uh, 
uh, our online community right now stands at like 160k across social media platforms and thanks to them in 2022 we got an honorary mention at the Pixar's Pixar's Electronica 2022 that's the award and that's Tanmay in the background that's our pretty office this is our lovely team this is from Bangalore where we held privacy supreme uh, like we were talking about memes, but we don't just do memes. Our literacy work uh, stretches from accessible infographics, quirky videos, and long form briefs. And if you think that uh, we are good at what we do, like these people across uh, social media, next slide. I'd like to stop. <laughs> I'd like to stop and ask you guys uh, stop for a cat intervention. Uh, Please sign up to become an IFF member so that we can expand our, our literacy efforts and make uh, these conversations more accessible and serve you the dystopia with more memes. Uh, yes, uh, in 2022, as physical spaces opened up, IFF also went back to physical events. We organized two ma major physical events. Uh, first, time, the first time in Bangalore, uh, previously Supreme, which also fe uh, featured curated artwork from five different artists. And uh, late in 2022 with News Laundry, uh, hi Jadranchu. <laughs> <laughs> we put together the first edition of Focon, Impolite Con Conversations. Here are some pretty, pretty pictures from our event. For the numbers though, I'll skip. Uh, please uh, look out for our year end blog post. You'll find all of them there. Uh, a quick walk through through our uh, main projects in the literacy vertical. We are working with Tactical Tech to translate their exhibition, The Glassroom, into Indian languages, starting with Hindi and Malayalam. And uh, we intend to take these uh, exhibitions like uh, throughout Indian cities. So 2023, look out. Uh, apart from that, we are also revamping our, uh, uh, how do I say it, our old website. <laughs> and. Uh, Incredible volunteers are helping us uh, revamp it. One of them is here today, Ishita. Thank you for your uh, help throughout the year. Coming to 2023, uh, I'll make it short. We intend to make more physical appearances, more physical events. We intend to go beyond Delhi, beyond English. Uh, we intend to reach out to a broader audience. That's why we are uh, setting up a dedicated video vertical. Uh, apart from that, we are also expanding on the platforms that we use, uh, RIP Twitter, so we are moving to Mastodon. We are also building a great Telegram community. Uh, you'll find the link somewhere in the presentation. Please uh, find it and scan it and join it. Uh, we are also building out strong mailing lists. And I guess that's it. Yes, I hand over to Shilpa, who is the token Gen Z <laughs> person at IFF. Thanks, Ashleesh. Um, hello, I'm Shilpa. I'm the Community Fundraising Associate at IFF. And when Tejasi said that she hoped you got a drink, I wish she had said two because we're back to the numbers. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to take a minute to thank all of the people who have donated to IFF. All of the work, the incredible work that my colleagues have presented today has been made possible because of their generous donations and support. So how did fundraising do this year? Uh, Apar wanted me to describe it as neither roses nor thorns, but like Ashlesh said, I'm the token Gen Z staffer, so I'm just gonna say it was pretty mid. Um, we had our ups, we had our downs, and uh, this year we received a total of 1 crore 4 lakh 45,377 in donations from members, one-time donors, and organizational donors. Our total costs for the year were 97 lakh 72,211, most of which went towards staff salaries and operational costs. About half our expenses per month were met by contributions from individual Indian donors, while the other 50% was covered by donations from organizations. Uh, I want to shout out to Live Law, Dusra, Sensible, Sas Bhumi, The Onward Foundation, No Gray Area, and Frankly Wearing for their generosity this year. That's your cue to thank them also. <laughs> Uh, we also received a grant from UNESCO as part of the Global Media Defense Fund for our work on the Digital Patrika Defense Clinic. Let's go litigation team. Um, 
This year, we've seen a really incredible growth in our membership base. It's grown from 190 at the beginning of the year to 309 at present. Clap for yourselves. <laughs> While at the same time, we've also seen a decline in one-time donations from individual donors. Uh, to increase individual giving this year, we hosted two fundraisers. Uh, so in May, we had a fundraiser to raise 30 lakhs and sign up 100 members. Uh, we were able to raise 16 lakhs and sign up 66 new members. In October, Live Law very generously hosted a fundraiser to help us meet our expenses for that month, through which we were able to raise 3.8 lakhs. What are some of the downs I was talking about? The central challenge for us is financial stability. Um, we, our organizational targets of staffing and talent have been met with increased costs, and we have a monthly burn rate of about 40 to 50%, which is met by institutional grants, organizational donations, reserves, and our staff taking up independent projects. Uh, in 2023, we hope to build out a more solid membership base uh, with high net worth individuals and Indian, individual Indian donors, around 1,200 to 1,500 of them, providing us 9 lakhs per month to stabilize our work. We're also going to be focusing on building multi-year partnerships with organizational donors. So, uh, you know, if anyone wants to hit me up after this, that's totally fine. Um, we largely operate on a retail fundraising model that prioritizes individual giving, which means we want to make it as easy for you as possible to donate to us. Um, but this year, unfortunately, we've faced several challenges in that. Um, we've had issues with our payment processing as well as our donor management systems. In 2023, we're going to be taking steps to uh, steps towards resolving those problems. Uh, this year, we also introduced Cash Free as an alternative payment platform to Razor Pay uh, after concerns were raised by our community. Uh, in 2023, we also hope to diversify community building and outreach efforts to for a more wider and more diverse membership base, particularly beyond metropolitan areas. Finally, before I go, a lot of you may have seen IFF's merch outside. Uh, it's on the registration desk. If you haven't picked up some already, you should go ahead and do that. Uh, but uh, in and like not to brag, but it really is some of the coolest merch. Um, <laughs> In 2023, we're working with Frankly Wearing to partner with some stupendously talented Indian artists to launch a new collection of merch. So keep your eyes open for that. And on hopefully that very exciting note, uh, I'm going to invite Apar uh, to take the stage and talk about what IFF is going to be doing in 2023 as an organization. Uh, so thank you so much, Shilpa. And I think a lot of what we'll be doing in terms of program work in terms of a substance has been fleshed out. Now, let me go back to where we started from. It was Save the Internet, IFF being a public organization by itself. What is a public organization if it's controlled by four or five people from the beginning to the end? The sentence is meant to be uncomfortable for all of you. It is meant to be uncomfortable for all of you who are watching this, because this is being recorded and will be put online. Because this is a deeper question to us. If IFF has been funded with close to 4,000 ordinary Indians on a day-to-day -day basis, it means it is special. It is something else. It comes from some ability of promise, which means three things. The first is our commitment to transparency. And here, I would like to congratulate the IFF board for actually pushing ahead with transparency and publishing our bylaws. I bylaws now not only outline board processes, but are published and also publish each board proceeding with the minutes and the decisions by itself. This is not something novel. In fact, it was brought to my notice by one of our community members who actually participates in these technical communities regarding software development. So as much as people say DAO, right? We actually just want to publish more of how we do our work and how we take the decisions that we do. And if you go on the IFF website right now, it's not only financial transparency, each board decision is published. Each board decision in terms of how the board is reaching that decision will also be published in future. We will in fact be publishing all of our internal guides because it is my thinking as well as one which has been contributed to the Save the Internet movement is that India today does not need one IFF. In fact, it needs 10 IFFs. 
or 20 different forms of organizations which work on advocacy and digitization at its very core. And this can be accelerated when one, all of our guides, how do we engage with different policy processes, how we break it down, is actually distributed and made more democratic. So we are doing that. We are committing to that. There's a timeline in the bylaws, and we are sticking by it. The second thing is that the person should not become the institution, which means me. And I want to deal with it very candidly. I've always said that I had a six-year term at IFF, and it will build out in future. This means my term as an executive director. And my term, more or less, will end in 2023 towards the end. But a transition which needs to be orderly and planned needs to be done. This has been a particular challenge for Indian organizations. And I would like to recognize it, which means that I will not be giving up certain core functions if it is required by the organization. I continue as a trustee but I do not exercise my voting rights in a way to interfere with the management team. Here I take some learning, and I think some people may criticize me for them, for them from the much more corporate world. Okay, but I do. I think there's some thinking there which we can apply to ourselves as public organizations, which is also beneficial. The third thing is the board by itself, which at, sits at the top and takes these decisions as much as the public funds us. Now, when the Save the Internet movement started out, the people who were most active on Twitter, and that's the practical reality, became the leaders of the Save the Internet movement, right? And then they became trustees at IFF. But that left a lot of people out. That also reduced diversity. Initially, they were all men and just one woman who was there in terms of gender. In terms of a metropolitan focus and bias, it was inordinately in favor of people who were either in Delhi, Bangalore, or Bombay who spoke English. And this by itself is not representative of the kind of digitization which is taking place today, of the communities and the audiences and the people who engage with our work in different languages, from different socioeconomic strata, from different social identities, gender groups, caste groups by itself, which is why when IFF will open up Next year, it's trustee induction process. It will be through a public process in which people can participate. Again, this is nothing novel. It is done by other organizations, and I encourage that more do it in the uh, in future. All of this is outlined in our bylaws. Now, before I end, I asked Chat GPT three to write <laughs> three jokes. Okay, to dull to dull all the seriousness of what I've said. And I'm just uh, workshopping an email I'll send with this video. So the first joke, uh, which I modified, all of them, uh, it's not chat GPT, actually. It's first policy GPT for drafting public consultation responses where every sentence starts with, quote, we appreciate the chance to submit our views, but. <laughs> the second joke is a crypto exchange called Doglapan for funding digital rights. It's still in stealth because we are trying to secure IPL advertising rights. <laughs> the third one, actually, I don't know uh, whether it's a Mastodon instance or not. It's a social media network for absolute, completely absolute free speech. But then we ran a poll and 57.5%, 57.5% of users voted to shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hope not only the people who are here, but who are watching, not only view our work in 2022, but also look at what we've outlined for 2023, these ambitious targets from the litigation, from the policy team, uh, what we hope to do organizationally, to be a truly public-centered organization. And you can scan the QR code, go to our implementation plan, and help support us. For the people who are here, we are outside, have a chat with us, have a conversation with us. And going with all things which are born on the internet, it should always end with Rick Astley. Ashlesh, please. We are serving drinks again.